Okay, welcome to a tippling philosopher and a an interview I'm really excited to host uh, and be a part of. Uh, I do have to apologise, but uh, for the fact that I've just cocked up a live stream for the the advertise, I've ad thrown this link out everywhere, and it turns out that um, I, I started it and stopped it straight away because I have a bit of tremor in my fingers with my multiple sclerosis, and I went da 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 da, and uh, and I started the live broadcast and stopped it immediately so there's like one second of live has just gone and then everyone's got that view, that that uh that interview link and it, it's messed it all up so that's uh, i blame no. my disability because uh, that's easy and everyone <laughs> feels sorry for you then anyway <laughs> it's forgivable uh, yeah this is it um dr kip davis i mean uh, questions hey already uh, uh, questions already come in and i am going to repeat this question which is to say, who is uh, Dr. Kit Davis? So who are you? Introduce yourself I'm and tell us something that we need to know about you. Big fat nobody, really. Um, so I have, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a biblical scholar and a specialist in uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, early Judaism with a strong focus on uh, material culture and um, manuscript construction, uh, scribal practices, uh, those sorts of things. And um, I taught uh, for many years in, uh, in both uh, confessional Christian schools and state schools here in Canada, as well as in, uh, in Europe. I've taught in, the, in uh, Norway and Germany and maybe a little bit in the UK too, I think. Yeah. So... Um, that's me. And if people recognize me, I, it's from, I have a YouTube channel. Um, it's just under my name, Kip Davis. And I do, uh, lots of counter apologetic stuff and I'm going to be doing more and more, uh, stuff with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I was also, uh, featured in a documentary on PBS Nova once a couple of years ago. Ooh, before... That's exciting. So, so what, what was that uh, concerning? So that was I was uh, one of the uh, one of the principal investigators in the uh, in in the whole fiasco of uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls forgeries that showed up in private collections in uh, in Norway uh, and the United States between uh, about 2002 and uh, 2014. So I was actually working. I was actually working with. Um, uh, a private collector in Norway at the time, and also editing uh, scrolls fragments for the Museum of the Bible uh, when when all this uh, all this came up. So I wrote a couple of articles, got some attention, and uh, the rest is history. That, that's <laughs> that's pretty exciting. So um, actually, before we go on to discuss uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, What's your experience with belief and deconversion, if indeed you have had one? I mean, yeah. for us, you've got experience of the UK because you, you were in Manchester, University of Manchester for some time. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, is that where you got your PhD? Yeah, so I, I did my uh, PhD at the University of Manchester, working with the eminent uh, George J. Brooke. Uh, my opinion, one of the best, uh, best Dead Sea Scrolls uh, scholars alive today. Right, so that that's that's pretty damn uh, impressive. Um, so, what uh, what is your experience of of religion and deconversion? So, um, I'm glad you asked because uh, this is something that uh, that I've not talked a lot about um, publicly. I guess it, it's it's come up here and there in uh, in some of the streams that I've done. But um, uh, and actually, um, uh, Dr. Joshua Bowen, myself, and uh, and uh, Dr. Dan McClellan, who has a pretty solid uh, TikTok following, uh, we were just on a on a stream last night on um, Captain Dadpool's channel, where we talked quite a bit about scholarship and faith. Um, so for me, I was I was born and I grew up 
<clears throat> an evangelical. Uh, my my family forever attended a uh, a Baptist church in the North American Baptist, yeah, the North American Baptist Conference, which is like a like a German conference here in uh, Canada and the United States. So we were good German Baptists. Um, I started at uh, Bible college with the intention of going into um, professional ministry. And wow, so you at this age, you, you were pretty committed, you know, even oh. as you, so, so, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, yeah, yeah. as you were, this is obviously before you're go, you've gone to university, you, you are a well read Christian or a dedicated Christian, a thoughtful Christian, an intellectual Christian, an evangelical, you know, what kind of, yeah. I think I was, I was, um, I mean, I was pretty young. I was only, I was only 20 years old when I started uh, college. So I don't know how well read um, I was or intellectual. I was, I was attracted to uh, intellectual philosophical arguments, um, but didn't really know anything about them until I got to Bible college. And I spent a few years uh, in Bible college, and I had a very strong interest from the early going in the original languages. Uh, so kind of set my focus there uh, early on. Uh, and I ended up transferring. I uh, After a couple years of doing the Bible college thing, came to realize that this really wasn't the, 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 the professional ministry thing really wasn't going to work with my personality and with my own goals i started to become much more uh interested in uh in the background of uh, the bible in biblical studies in uh in the history and the languages and the literature so with that shift in focus i transferred into a christian university um i graduated with my ba i went straight into uh, a master's degree um and the program I was in had a strong focus on on the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is really where I got to know what the scrolls are. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so but during this time, there was, I guess, a, a progressive uh, period of deconstruction. I, I think it was probably by the time I finished my B.A., I had I had walked quite a distance back uh, away from uh a more i don't a more fundamentalist type of faith and had embraced something much more progressive much more mainstream um we still attended an evangelical church but i rolled my eyes often um as i listened to to preachers talk about things in the bible that they 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 didn't know and didn't really understand um so it, you know there was a movement away from there um so what and, you how were you, what was triggering your movement away? What was was it a moral? Was it a, like a a cultural moral uh, tension where where you get a lot of people deconverting from evangelical Christianity because it doesn't fit with their modern sensibilities? Maybe I've I've known people who are like, well, the views on homosexuality are wrong because I know homosexual people and they're really nice and they're not going to hell. It seems, yeah. or you know, is it is it like a cultural moral thing or was it? No, more? it was for me. It was all about the the texts right, right. Uh, and it was it was all about how how much of the idea of uh inspiration and infallibility i was having to abandon at every stage along the way and actually i i distinctly remember a point in time when i was still in grad school where i felt like you know i'm at a tipping point where i have to make a decision on the basis of what I've learned about uh, the text, you know, there, there, there likely is, if there is a historical kernel to, you know, the Old Testament uh, uh, narratives and and stories, if there's an historical kernel there, it's 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 minimal and it probably doesn't look much like like how the text presents it. There's all sorts of of problems within the text that that scholars are working towards resolving. All this sort of stuff had me at a tipping point where I I distinctly remember thinking I either have to just abandon ship altogether or I have to I have to find 
a new way to construct a new theological model in order to to accommodate all this this information that I'm gathering and, and this stuff that I'm learning about the Bible. And that's the direction I ultimately ended up going. Um, you know, I I became much more mainstream in my in my thinking and in I guess in my own uh in my own Christian uh confession where uh I believed I believed in Jesus and I believed in the resurrection uh as as an inexplicable event uh that uh that uh, confounded history and from an historical perspective was difficult uh to reconcile or to uh validate so for me it became very much like like a spiritual sort of thing right this is this is really interesting so uh and this is pertinent to the kind of discussions i've been having on some of my videos i've been doing over the last few days and we're going to go off, off tangent for what i planned for us to talk about completely here uh -oh. but um and this is how Derek Lambert of MythVision also described his movement away from Christianity, which is a movement towards a more esoteric kind of spiritual understanding of a deity because uh, the, a literal understanding of the revelation through the Hebrew Bible and the, and the New Testament was problematic. And he couldn't, mm. uh, you know, reconcile these texts with history, with this and that. And so therefore you're like, OK, I've got a problem. And yet I've just been having like the, these videos I'm doing on a census and the nativity and all this kind of, yeah. like, how do you marry the 10 year gap of Herod and the census and Quirinius? And what are the, what are the precedents for such censuses and what, what's Luke actually saying? And man, I'm getting hit by some trolls, but also yeah. people like Lydia McGrew. Oh, sure. With, with whom I've argued before. And they and they're, uh, the, the idea, and I can understand what they're going through, which is a kind of form of presuppositionalism. So it's like I I have to presuppose that these two narratives, Luke and Matthew, absolutely cohere. They're a cogent, cohesive, single narrative. Because if as soon as I allow this not to be the case, it's a house of cards. So yeah. either one or both of these gospels are problematic, and then I have to say, well, how, what else is 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 a problem? And then it's all like, oh, I can have no certainty in any of this revelation. Yeah. Yeah, you know, along the way, I'm actually going to just grab a couple of things from my bookshelf here. Thank you so much, Margaret. That is absolutely amazing. Really, really appreciate it. you. You get the uh, the awesome uh, responsibility and respect for being the first ever um, super chat. Uh, Congratulations! Yes, <laughs> um, person on my channel. So that, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. So. In the period during during this time when I was when I was experiencing this, I, it really was a, a crisis of faith for me. I, you know, I turned to uh, some really really good literature. Like this is um, this is a book by uh, where are we going here? There we go. Yeah, Kenton Sparks, God's, God's Word in Human in Human Words. Yeah, yeah. and if Evangelical Appropriation of Critical Biblical Scholarship. Kenton Sparks is a, like just a phenomenal. Uh, ancient Near Eastern specialist uh, who teaches at, um, um, I think he, at the time, I think he was actually at North Northwestern, um, but, uh, but also an evangelical Christian. Uh, so he wrote this book where he basically went through, you know, the, uh, the problems that critical scholarship pose for the Bible. And instead of the, uh, a, a typical e apologetic, uh, attempt to gloss everything said yeah these are real problems and uh these are these are real reasons why evangelicals should abandon these ideas about inspiration infallibility the historicity of the text we can't hold on to this kind of stuff anymore and so he goes into um uh uh constructing a what he calls you know a, a divine and human forms of discourse as a way to, to I guess, um, maintain faith, maintain a, a a Christian commitment, while also recognizing uh, the very very strong and pronounced human elements within the text, even things that that we recognize as as completely 
you know, irreconcilable with history, such as, you know, the census and the virgin birth narratives and things like that. Right. So, and I, I sort of, I, I, I held on to, uh, to this kind of a model for a long time. Another one here too. This is, um, the human faces of God by Tom Stark. I Tom love Stark's that. Brilliant. Tom Stark, uh, sorry to interrupt, but he uh, yeah, yeah. wrote a fantastic free PDF online, which is, is God a moral oh, compromiser yeah. as a response his... to Paul Copens is God a moral monster. And it is so just slapped down. Uh, is he still a Christian? I wonder. Tom Stark? I'm, I don't know. He kind of dropped off um, mm. the, uh, the blogosphere after a while. I know he had other interests, like he's a filmmaker, mm. right? So, I don't know what he's doing anymore, but uh, I love the 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 subtitle of this book is what scripture reveals when it gets God wrong and why inerrancy tries to hide it. Um, and this, too, took took a similar approach to, you know, it doesn't do us any good to ignore or to try attempt to compensate for the problems in the text. We have to we have to hit those dead on. We have to we have to acknowledge them. And I loved the analogy he gave was uh that uh, he's a very good writer um and and uh I, I i greatly appreciated that about him but while i was while i was still in the church um the analogy he gave was of a you know having an uncle who's an alcoholic and you love your uncle who's an alcoholic even though every single time he shows up at Christmas, he he makes an ass of himself and he embarrasses everybody. Um, he hurts people, but you have you you still love him, and he's still your uncle, and he's still part of your family. And he used this uh, this picture as a way of of talking about the Bible. The Bible is the drunk uncle. The Bible is what the church inherited, and it's full of problems, and it's frequently embarrassing and it's always causing problems and it's always making people within the church cry but it's ours and we still have to we still have to love the text we still have to we have to figure out how to maintain the text that we have and and to to make sense of it and the only way to do that is to grapple with it painfully and and to to um you know do what you can to live at peace with uh, the text like you do your drunk uncle so yeah yeah and i think that the problem starts with this infallibility notion of infallibility which is you just because when you start being shackled you are literally enslaved to this presupposition of infallibility so you don't argue to infallibility you, there's no way that you you look at all the claims in the bible right and all all the different voices and we'll hopefully get time to talk about like the documentary yeah. hypothesis a little bit but you have all these different sources being being cobbled together over time and that that goes on through the new testament as well uh, to so that you do not have a single narrative at all there is no way that you can you can start building up uh, and then arrive at well this is infallible so the yeah. only way you get infallibility is by starting with that with that conclusion and saying, right, how can I maintain infallibility? And so therefore, what happens is you start coming up with excuses and coulds and maybes and these really modal claims, which is which really load down a probability list and saying, well, OK, so so we've got this census here and we've got Herod here and there's a 10 year gap. So what might have happened? What what can I conceive conceptually? what might be an explanation okay Quirinius ruled twice or this that yeah. blah, blah, blah. And, and what you do is you then lay out a load of different explanations for the data and you end up having to pick the least probable one yeah, yeah. and infallibility leads to desperation that leads to the least possible explanation for the least probable explanation for, for events and it makes your apologetics look entirely ad hoc yeah and that is no that's 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 my experience as well and I, I would say too the other thing that that I well, while I was still while I was still uh, a, a confessing Christian one of the things that I I fought bitterly against was uh, how much apologetics and and how much attempts to rescue the text actually um, rob people of what I think is a much more robust fuller uh, exciting appraisal of the text themselves because there's a lot of really 
there's there's a lot of amazing things that you can you can glean out of the text if you're willing Goodness to allow me. it to speak for itself. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. But just I'm going to pause you there. Can I? Uh, you seem to be called Doctor Kill. <laughs> this is a new bit of knowledge. Uh, there's reference. Doctor Kill is everywhere. You apparently are everywhere. You are omnipresent. You are maybe part of the. Tri you are a triadic god. Maybe I'm, I don't. I'm part. Yes, I am. Uh, I am. I am the consort of Yahweh. You are the one. Uh, <laughs> and also, uh, so so thank you so much to Cool J Ledge there for 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 that um, contribution. That's amazing. And also Mr. Willis for saying uh, Merry Christmas, even though it's all BS. Um, and he saw oh. his lads today, so I'm really happy for him. That's awesome. Uh, Merry Christmas to one and all. I love Christmas. But, and I'm not a, a Christian. so. But it's good. not. I, I'm just going to push back on this a little bit and say, you know, it's not BS. I mean, because it means something to yeah. to us, right? Well, certainly, maybe certainly not for everybody. I I recognize that that Christmas could be a really challenging time of year for a lot of people, and my heart goes out to them. Um, but for 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 so many, um, you know, even uh, those of us who who have uh, have rejected the 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 Christian narrative about Christmas, it's still a very very meaningful uh, time. Yeah, I, year, I produced a, a video on this a couple of videos back, which is uh, I'm an atheist, Merry Christmas, which is you awesome. make up your own meaning. Uh, half of so there's this article written by a Catholic uh, a priest who, who basically said uh, atheists are, are appropriating Christmas. Mm -hmm. and it's the idea that actually, well, most of the traditions were pre existed Christmas, uh, you know, the Christian Christmas anyway, and you've appropriated pre existing stuff. So, A, that's wrong, and B, you're a hypocrite, and C, we can make our own meaning. Exactly. Like when, when you have May like Day, who the hell cares, really? Yeah. <laughs> it's when you like, have, when you have yeah. May Day, you're not d dancing in England. You have a bank holiday, so you take a day off. You sit in your pajamas, or you go for a long weekend, or whatever. You're not dancing around a maypole doing Morris dancing, which is what was originally the inception of like the May bank holiday or the May Day. Right. right? So, so we can change right. things and and create meaning for ourselves but yeah. that's true anyway. so i was just going to say one more thing yeah. with response to with regards to my my um uh my conversion deconversion yeah. story and um so it actually i don't think the final nail was was the 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 his, this historical textual literary problems of the text because i actually found uh quite a bit of new and exciting uh meaning in in my new models for uh for hand dealing with the text and with um and with my faith um what really really pushed me uh away was uh i guess a couple of things i when i was i guess in 2000 it was 2012 i started a um a new appointment in norway um so i moved the whole family out uh out there and um, in large part because of the language gap early on, while we were uh, while we were there, uh, we just found better things to do on Sunday morning than to go to church. Um, and, and that that you know everybody in my family was pretty happy about the fact that we weren't going to church anymore. Um, and the other thing was, so I have um, I have three boys. They're they're all. Uh, older teenagers, young adults now, but um, all three of our kids uh, were adopted and uh, and all three of our kids uh, spent time in the foster care system here in uh, Canada. And, uh, you know, without getting into it, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of extra um, baggage that comes with that. Um, in terms of development and in terms of uh, I, I learned so much through this experience about about, I guess, developmental psychology, about about the effects of uh, of relationships and attachment on the brain and about, you know, various other things that my 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 poor kids endured, you know, before they came into into uh, our care uh, that really it, it really messed them up in a lot of respects and i think for me i i think that was that was the really the point where i was like you know so much of this stuff so much of the science mm. in what happens 
developmentally just does not make any sense in a in a model uh of the world that that maintains you know uh uh i guess not even it, it wasn't even so much a theodicy for me why does god allow uh bad things to happen to good people it was more a uh a matter of 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 just the enormous design flaws yeah, um, you you are you are making me chomp at the bit to want to talk about free will, determinism, <laughs> causal determination in turn, and then judgment of heaven and hell. And I'm, I'm not the like, guy to talk to about that. But, but, but that was for saying. me. That was it, right? So I've, it's... I've just written a book called Thirty Arguments Against God." It will be uh, oh. against the existence of God, heaven, hell. Oh no, what's it called? Thirty arguments against the existence of God, uh, divine design heaven hell and satan right so yeah. it's 30 arguments all along these kind of lines but the what you're saying is is one of the arguments i present which is so, yeah you know if you, if you are given uh things in your life over which you have no control that lead you down a certain path and then you're judged on account of those causal variables over which you had no control then that is inherently unfair and if that's what god is doing through judgment and and resulting heaven and hell then god is unfair yes and so that can just, manifest in loads of different ways but yeah just one quick example here um from the time he was really little our uh our, our middle son um we literally uh could not get him into into the church building just because he had such an abject fear of death and of of hell and he couldn't help but think about all this stuff every time we you know he was he was in in church and it was and it was was seriously crippling and anxiety mm. inducing for him to the point it took him a long time uh to get through that and I, you know for for his for my wife and myself this was just a, this was just a heart-wrenching heartbreaking moment of like this this is monstrous yeah this doesn't work wow. mm. so but yeah yeah this you know, it it's it's the hitting it's a hitting with a, an almighty stick and a, and a bribing with an almighty carrot and it, it's like you know leading people through life tr you know come on here's the massive carrot the greatest thing in human conception heaven and here's a massive yeah. stick greatest thing in human conception because there is nothing worse that you can imagine worse than hell because hell is literally the worst thing you can imagine that's right and then you're just torturing people especially young people with these ideas it's just not healthy exactly so um Mar margaret margaret says to so did dr davis ever feel a sense of betrayal by the community he most trusted i did and do and it's a difficult feeling to shake yeah oh yeah many times actually um and and i you know i i had a conversation with a good friend um this summer who is actually um a, a baptist minister um and uh, uh just a really terrific guy too but uh, you know i had i had i had uh said to him at one point um that i don't think anybody ever actually i don't believe anybody actually makes the decision um to to be a christian uh, or to remain a Christian on the on the intellectual merits, um, I think it, it has everything to do with uh, with with the uh, the emotion and and the uh, the community and just the you know it's very much an internal personal thing. I I've heard William Lane Craig actually say this exact same thing. I think, um, and my friend he said yes. He said I, I I agree with you. This is you know my my pastor friend agreeing with me. Uh, and that, but then he said, you know, I, by the same token, he says, I don't think anybody ever actually leaves just on the basis of those, of, of the, the intellectual shortcomings of the mm -hmm. faith. And I had to think about that because, yeah. you know, I've always considered myself pretty coldly analytical and, you know, well, I, I'm pretty sure that, that my journey away had everything to do with, with, um, um you know this 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 intellectual deconstruction hmm. but i have to admit to myself too i'm like no you know i was damaged uh hmm. along the way a number of times i remember um i think it was the last church that we attended here in canada 
Um, I, and as a person with my kind of training and in my kind of position, I've also come to understand that I'm an uncomfortable parishioner um, for a pastor, especially a pastor who doesn't, who, who doesn't know uh, the text like I do, you know, in the, the last church that we attended here in Canada, uh, the pastor who preached from the pulpit was, was a former high school basketball coach. So, um, you know, there were, were you just sitting in the pews going, uh, 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 I think if I know, uh, that, that's not what's got my interpretation of that, that passage is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and there were lots of time and I, Early on, I kind of I made myself available to him and I said, look, it was a very, very large church, too. Right. And I, you know, I, I introduced myself to him. I said, look, this is who I am. This is what I do. I can help you. Um, you know, I can I can walk you through some of this stuff in the text and help you to understand it. And I think make it uh, more real and effective for you. And he was, you know, gracious. And yeah, that's that's terrific. I I like that. Um, he and I sat down and had a meeting one day uh talked about a bunch of things and at the end of that meeting he 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 asked me a question he said so he says i have one more question for you he goes that whole story in genesis chapter six he says and this is the this is the story of the um uh uh the the depravity of of humanity and which ultimately led to yahweh's decision to to flood the earth he says, that whole story is like, do you really think those are angels coming down and having sex with women, with like human women? And this was a question I, I, I caught on right away that this is, this guy is asking me if I think this is something that actually happened. And it was sort of at that point where I, I quickly realized, yeah, this is, this is not this is not going to happen the way I, I had hoped it would. This is not going to work. And it wasn't a few weeks later, he actually, from the pulpit in front of hundreds of people, um, without naming names, uh, very publicly uh, called me out as, you know, as, as like, you know, those, those intellectuals in their high towers who think they have all the answers you know, you you have to read what the text says, and 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 you can't listen to to these people. Well, that was that made me mad, and yeah. that was very personally damaging. And it's those sorts of things. Yes, I have I have experienced plenty of of uh, moments of betrayal by my own community, and it and it has been in incredibly hurtful. Um, and I'd be lying to myself if I didn't say that had a, a huge effect on um, how I ended up where I am today yeah. in terms of my I, faith commitments. And it, it is even worse by the point of fact that, do you know what? Sometimes the people in those ivory towers do have all the answers. Sometimes we do. <laughs> do, do you know what? Deal with it. it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it just seems, it's, it just seems ridiculous to me that, that you would thumb your nose at somebody who's dedicated literally his entire life to studying and to learning about uh, a particular minutia of our world. Um, you know, why not? Why not listen to yeah. those people who have, have this made this investment? It just, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and if I was to psychoanalyze you as a armchair psychoanalyst, which I have absolutely no uh, qualification to do, but I have the balls to do it. But let's do it anyways. <laughs> yeah. Which is to say, this is interesting because I think I said the same thing to Josh. Uh, was it Josh or um, uh, Joshua Byrne? Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and possibly uh, a few others I talked to about deconversion, which is when you talk about, you said earlier, and I thought that was fascinating at the beginning of this talk when you said it was an intellectual deconstruction that deconverted me from Christianity. And my first thoughts are like, I wonder if that's how you saw it. Yeah. But there's a reality that's going on underneath, which is you had all these things in place, all your ducks in a row from a psychological point of view that allowed you to, to intellectually deconvert and saw the intellectual 
part of that as the main route and, and everything about your deconversion because that was your rational brain sort of going. But actually, you had a community in place. Yeah. You had people who believed the same. You had a, 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 a knowledge that if you did deconvert, you weren't going to be ostracized. Or I don't know. I'm 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 guessing here because I have no. No, idea this is this true. is true. And I've I've told people too. Like I'm, you know, I did not. I was not looking for a way out. Absolutely not. I, I loved my Christian life very much. Um, my wife left so less so she's pretty she's pretty happy about, about finding excuses to 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 stop believing. But but for me, I think it was it was different. It was a lot more painful. Um, and I've often told people, and I'm I'm still one hundred percent open to you know if if i can if i can find a way back in <laughs> i I'd, I'd be open to it i totally yeah. would i just as as i told my mom you know and as i've told a, a few of the friends that i've 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 uh i've come out of the closet to um i have no control over what i believe no, I this is in don't. philosophy. This is called doxastic involuntarism. Okay, so yeah. this is literally like a, this is a philosophical idea that you can't choose choose your beliefs. So you can't say, uh, "Do you know what? I'm going to believe now that the moon is made of cheese." That's that's called doxastic voluntarism, which means I can voluntarily change a belief, and no one really believes that. So you have this idea of doxastic involuntarism, which is to say that. I, my, I need to meet a, a kind of intuitive threshold that I don't consciously decide. My, my non-conscious brain it, it evaluates all of the evidence for whether the moon is made of cheese or not, right? And then mm -hmm. at some point, when enough evidence is reached and there's enough reasons for me to believe that, then my brain goes and switches to a belief in the moon is made of cheese. But it's not something you can just decide to believe consciously. No, no, not at all. So like for me, it's just a matter of I can't keep lying to myself and to others about, you know, about who I am and what I what I think and what I believe. So, Absolutely. So yeah. thank you so much to uh, Old Before My Time with a good £6.66. Uh, we like that. Congratulations on your channel. Great host and great guest. Happy solstice for tomorrow. Thanks, man. That is really, really cool. Loads of comments going on. I um, uh, really appreciate that. And we haven't even got onto the main subject yet. Uh, Dr. Kip, oh my goodness, festering boils. This is the this is an amazing question because I have written down here Psalm 22, and we're going to talk about this later. Which awesome. is Dr. Kip, which was the first English translation to use pierced in Psalm 22? Hold that thought. We're going to come back to that, I hope. Uh, that's a really good question. That is I'm a sorry good I'm question. I'm not, not going to allow him to answer it yet. <clears throat> but I'm going to try and stick to something uh, vaguely uh, looking like uh, an agenda, um, but there you go. So, Dr. Kit, thanks for that introduction, which has now lasted 37 <laughs> minutes, 38 minutes. Well, something <laughs> that, you'll learn about me very quickly is is I don't do things briefly. No. I'm sorry for that. So. so that's great. So we've we've done the first two questions. <laughs> uh, no, it's legendary. Thank you. Um, so you have an interest in the Dead Sea Scrolls for the newbie. What are these and why are they important? And this will hopefully come on to that, that question, that Psalm 22 question later, because it's, it is connected. It, it, it definitely is. So, yeah, um, most simply, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, is a designation given to um, manuscripts and uh, so, so text artifacts that have been discovered uh, in a variety of different caves in different places all throughout the Judean desert. Um, these include Qumran, Matsada, Nachal Hever, um, uh, Murabat. Um, um, there's, there's a few other uh, localities. The most famous of these is, uh, is Qumran, and there's a, there's a very well-known story about this. Um, so uh, just, just, what the scrolls themselves are, what the manuscripts themselves are, are uh, early Judean uh, texts written between a period, written in a period of about uh, three or four hundred years between the late third century BCE to about the early to mid second century uh, CE. So, yeah, 
four, 500 year period. Uh, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of these manuscripts, a huge number of them preserve uh, biblical texts, uh, but the vast majority of them uh, also preserve the writings of, uh, of various Jewish uh, communities and religious groups, um, their ideology, uh, reflections of their theology and worldview, their rules. Um, huge numbers of these texts uh, are what we would uh, identify as Old Testament apocrypha or pseudepigrapha, that is writings outside of the the Bible that you know nobody in the later periods regarded as scripture per se, but which appear to have been clearly uh, very important for uh, for Jewish people living in and around the time of uh, of Jesus. So you know. Some of these you might consider uh, some some Jewish groups. It seems might have considered certain writings so-called scripture that you know other Jewish groups rejected as as scripture. What what it shows us is just a a, a period of I guess literary uh, theological competition uh, within early Judaism. Now the uh, the most famous of these scrolls were discovered at a place called Qumran. Uh, it's a grouping of about 11 caves in the uh, in the Marl Terrace and in the uh, in the rocks around on the uh, sorry on the uh, western shore of the Dead Sea, sort of on the northwest side, and they're all within about a one and a half kilometer radius of this uh, of the ruins of what appears to have been a a Jewish settlement of some sort. Um, strewn throughout these 11 caves are some uh eight or nine hundred individual manuscripts and 220 of these are copies of the hebrew bible uh portions of the hebrew bible and one of the reasons why the dead sea scrolls are so important the the first of these were discovered in 1947 and discoveries were made subsequently after that point um but one of the reasons why these are so important is because before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the earliest Hebrew manuscripts we had uh, for the Old Testament uh, were medieval. Um, the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex date to about the 900s or 1000 uh, CE AD. And these were the earliest copies of, of Hebrew writings that we had Hebrew Which biblical is, writings that we know, had incredibly late, very, very late. Now I, I will say there was one in the 1800s. There was a very, a small uh, papyrus fragment, which is really fascinating that was discovered called the Nash papyrus. Um, yeah. And it contains text of, uh, of the, the, uh, the 10 commandments, commandments, the Decalogue ec from Exodus and Deuteronomy. Um, there's, there's some really interesting textual things going on in this small manuscript, but this, you know, it's pretty small. It's little, it's this big. Um, it dates to about 150 BCE. And that, that also contains a sheet. Is it the Shema, which is a prayer, uh, that differs substantially from yes. the later, more canonical Masoretic text, yes, if exactly. I'm right, yeah. uh, but being more similar to the Septuagint, which is yes. a Greek translation of the Bible. So, just, just, sorry, just to... Oh, no, you carry on, you carry on. No, no, yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, up to this point, so we had, um, before the discovery of the scrolls, we had these very, very late Hebrew manuscripts, plus this this one little scrap that was fairly early. We had copies of uh, Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible, which dated, I believe, all the way back to, to um, about 100 or 200 BC. I could be wrong about that. Were these, were these Septuagint translations? Yes. So yeah. these are well, I, yeah. So these are are, are yeah, um, copies of of what we would call the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the of the Hebrew Bible. Although there's a very complicated <laughs> uh, set of answers to different questions there too that we don't have the time to get into. Um, so that's all we had. Now all of a sudden, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have literally hundreds of copies of Hebrew manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible that date to, you know, this period of time from about, 
you know, the late third century to the early second century. So, um, to, so to put that in numbers for people, that's uh, 250 BCE probably is the earliest one. Would that yeah, be right? Where yeah, that's about right. Uh, to just over 100 CE. Would that be right? Or yeah. somewhere in, in the second century CE? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, that's so, that's your range. So so why, why did this excite both Jewish scholars and Christian scholars or not even scholars, Christians and, and Orthodox Jews? So, um, f for various reasons. I mean, w one of the one of the reasons why uh, this was so exciting for for Christians um, is because this was this essentially pushed the um, uh, I guess the 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 hard data, the 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 source material, the 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 manuscripts themselves, this, this pushed the timeline back dramatically, mm. um, for a, a lot of manuscripts for a lot of, uh, biblical texts, you know, there was just as, as an example, um, critics had been making spurious accusations with regards to things like, um, uh, like, like the, the book of Isaiah or, uh, or the book of Daniel as, um, you know, post-Christian uh, po texts that had been tampered with by Christians, you know, after after the time of Jesus. Scholars generally recognize these sorts of arguments as nonsense, but among lay people, this this was uh, this was a talking point. Um, these manuscripts provided absolute proof that this was not the case um, for the most part. Uh, so Jews found these uh, incredibly important. And actually, the, the history of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls very interestingly follows um, a lot of the history of the formation of the State of Israel uh, as, as an interesting uh, footnote in history. The, uh, the first uh, Jewish scholar the first the first jewish man to see the dead sea scrolls uh was a brilliant uh old testament scholar at uh, the hebrew university by the name of eliezer sukenik um and he uh he actually saw the first of these scrolls on the very day that the uh the the british mandate for palestine uh, came to an end, and the state of Israel and and Israel declared statehood in uh, 1947. And there's been a movement. There there was a movement early on within um, within the state of Israel uh, to tie some of their legitimacy to this discovery. Um, and also, this this you know coincided with a a, a tremendous effort to basically nationalize. Uh, the entire collection of literature, and what I mean by that, that's you know they've they've basically taken ownership of um, of all of the scrolls, or at least as as many as they they could do so legally. But it, it uh, so for for the Jewish community, this was uh, this was definitely a source of um, of religious and national uh, identification. It's a way of of just um, more firmly establishing their own their own claims within the land as well as their own uh, their own their own religious ideology uh, but th many. there's an, an important po point possibly to to make as well that the torah was standardized in about 70 ce is that correct and so or or at some point the, the point is that these these texts show a v v variation in yeah. in, in that 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 means that they were pre-standardization and you can learn a lot yeah. from the fact that there there was a variety of different texts going on yes so and one of the things so one of the the things that the dead sea scrolls help us to see and one of the things that uh that christians continue to to um uh speak about is how the scrolls basically establish the form of the text as we have it today and that is absolutely true um, but it's complicated <laughs> because the Dead Sea Scrolls also establish 
forms of the text that were lost to history. And they also illustrate to us that there was a great deal of variety, textual variety, uh, when it comes to the Hebrew Bible. Um, and that there were ongoing discussions and dialogues about the shape of the uh, of the biblical text during the time of Jesus. And there were uh, these discussions even went so far as to, you know, uh, how do we even define what quote unquote scripture is and what does that even mean? So it's it's uh, it's a, a hugely, hugely complicated question. Um, Which, and it's but the, but that's that's sorry, but that's so go ahead. Like fascinating because yeah. because what, what we do nowadays, Jews and Christians alike, uh, is is look at a book that has a formalized, standardized set of writing in, and you go, "This is the revelation of God," and you go, "This is the divinely inspired writing." But this is how it is because uh, how could it not be? How could it? Because if it, if it was varied, then we'd have have to be using uh, subjective interpretative techniques in order to try and understand what the objective message from God might be. And that's hugely problematic. So we need to have this standardized text. But yeah. when you then go to the Dead Sea Scrolls and you see a variety of texts, then you're thinking, A, at the time these people were, were writing, they didn't have a standardized text. So how was that fair on them? If you're going to argue that the standardized text ends up being the one that God wants you to have, or well, what was going on in these two three four five hundred year pe period when there wasn't a standardized text and it also makes you understand that this is a very human process in order to end up standardizing those those varied texts yeah one of the things so one of the things that we see um the early jews doing in the dead sea scrolls um is uh with with great frequency they're working hard to fix problems that they already see within the text that they've inherited. So you end up with things like uh, like the Samaritan pen or um, a, a version of the text that looks like the Samaritan Pentateuch where there are huge harmonizations of problematic sections throughout throughout the uh, the first five books of Moses, the, the, the Torah, um, where there are obvious uh, textual inconsistencies and incongruities. You've got tons of manuscripts at Qumran that are you know harmonizing these things overriding some of the stuff in an effort to 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 provide clear explanation and to and to solve some of these what what seem to be irreconcilable issues so it's it's very very telling um of a form of scribal activity that we have to assume did not just start in the in the second century BC, no, there. This is an inherited. This is an inherited discipline uh, that obviously goes far back into the into the distant past, into the into the uh, period of of the formation of the 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 biblical text themselves. And at that point, you know, the questions become even more complicated. What what was there early on? How how early is some of this stuff? How did it change? Why did it change? So I don't know. I mean, for me, from an historical perspective, it's all very, very exciting. I will say I, one one other thing I wanted to say about um, about what the Dead Sea Scrolls have meant for Christianity as well. Yeah. Um, so with regards to the New Testament, with regards to uh, the study of uh, Jesus, uh, up until the 1940s, uh, there was there was still a very strong current of of seeing Christianity as very much a Roman, um, a Greco-Roman faith. Albert Schweitzer um, uh, had published uh, his seminal work about um, about Jesus as an apocalyptic Jew, apocalyptic Jewish prophet. Um, I think that was back in the uh, in the late twenties, early thirties. Already at that point, and that was gaining a lot of traction, but it wasn't, you know, not to the extent that uh, that it is today. And the Dead Sea Scrolls have helped tremendously with that to provide for uh, us a really clear understanding of the the cultural background of the New Testament. And they've helped to illustrate to us the very strong Jewish undercurrents in the writings of the New Testament, as well as in the writings of Paul. So 
this is where you know this is where they've they've been uh, really helpful for us to in terms of understanding who Jesus was and 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 what he did. Um, and it, like for example, um, I think it's in the Gospel of Luke um, where the uh, the followers of uh, John the Baptist come to Jesus and ask him, "Who do you who 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 are you?" And um, are you the one who we've been waiting for, the, the Messiah? And uh, Jesus responds to them, and he and he sw he cites fragments from uh, three prophecies in Second Isaiah, I believe. And I'm I'm going to get the the references wrong, but uh, but he he basically says to them something like, "Go and tell John that you know the deaf are receiving hearing, the blind are seeing, the dead are being raised." You know, and the message. The good news is being preached. So he's combining all these these different uh, snippets of 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 prophecies, oracles, poems from Second Isaiah, and um, saying, you know, this is this is who you should tell them that I am. And for a long time, you know, critics looked at this 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 selection of text and said, wow, you know, what is what is the author doing here? Like he's he's pulling just these these fragments out of out of nowhere and it seemed to um at, on the face of it it looked like this was a very very unique understanding of who the messiah was and what he would do um how much can we actually attribute this to early judaism or how much of this is is a you know a, a development of of this greco-roman phenomena that we call christianity well lo and behold in the dead sea scrolls there's one manuscript uh, Forky, um, Forky testimonium, in which uh, it actually there is a there is an early uh, collection of these precise same citations in the precise same order, um, which shows us that yeah there was this messianic expectation at the time of Jesus, and he was drawing from this. Or, or the gospel writers, at least, were drawing from this larger, uh, this larger matrix, this so larger ideology. It's not so much that the Dead Sea Scrolls prove Christianity or help to evidence Christianity or anything like that, but it's that they they help to understand the context, the milieu in which Christianity could emerge. And yes, this kind of if if you understand, I think there's a uh, a comment earlier about like eschatology and about how you know if if you're going to understand uh, um, Jesus as as a failed. Es eschatological you know apocalyptic prophet then you can better understand that through uh through the dead sea scrolls like you know the question is is this exactly uh, i think might dr kip address at some point to what extent there is a clear apocalyptic eschatology present right. in the dss and what the writers believe needed to be done to bring about the end before you answer that can i just say though sorry uh, i just had to say thank you to um uh, Dean McKenzie for a very generous contribution. I love these conversations. He says, uh, I have this very conversation with my wife, uh, the, the one we were talking about, about deconversion yeah. and, and whatnot. And I, just, I, I didn't decide to not believe. So the idea that you can't choose what you believe type thing. So thanks for that. That's awesome. We'll come on to the next super chat. But just uh, what, what do you have to say about uh, the eschatology concerned uh, with the Dead Sea Scrolls? So it's it's really complex. Um and what the and and I will say, um, you know, it, it. I wanted to add one thing. It, it does, yes, it, it shows the the cultural background from which Christianity emerged, but it also shows that this was a legitimately Jewish movement that mm -hmm. originated in Palestine. It wasn't some kind of Greco-Roman invention, right. Um, right? So, uh, in terms of eschatology, like like I said, it's very complex. The people who appear to have been been writing and collecting the 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 manuscripts from Qumran that we we tend mostly to label as the Dead Sea Scrolls had a they were they were fierce dualists who had this this um this very um concrete apocalyptic worldview that's also reflected in the New Testament um this idea of the forces of good and evil uh engaged in this 
you know this this cosmic struggle um that that has you know there's a shadow of this in in the actual events political events uh um of events of of the day things that surround us reflect what's going on in the in in this great cosmic battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil um the people who wrote and collected the dead sea scrolls were convinced that this cosmic battle was coming to a head and that the last days um which is their term for 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 the eschaton was the, was imminent that it was going to happen any day now and in order to be ready for this they had to to take themselves out separate themselves into the wilderness in order to prepare for the coming of uh yahweh his army uh the and and the messiahs uh they believed in two uh they believed that there would be a, an anointed king like david and an anointed priest like aaron mm. or Zadok. Uh, and that these these two figures would usher in a uh, a period of uh, peace and prosperity uh, for the uh, the Jewish people and uh, the destruction. Ne of, neither of uh, which of Jesus ended up being right. So like, oh yeah, exactly. So counts. he totally did. And for for the uh, the Qumran community, I mean, they met with uh, they met with similar disappointment. The uh, you know the Romans came in uh, after sacking Jerusalem on their way to Matsuda, uh passed through the uh, the settlement there where uh, where these people lived and uh, burned it, destroyed it, and uh, we have evidence that they the the library of they had the the caves the individual eleven caves themselves seem to have served some slightly different functions. Um, you know, one appears to have been sort of a collection or a library of some sort. Some of the other ones look like they were again Genizas, ancient Genizas. Some of them looked like they were just places where they stashed um, scrolls in a hurry, you know, just to just to get out of here because the Romans were coming and uh, with the the hope that they would come back later. But we see a number of scrolls actually are cut, um, sliced, kind of like ribbons. It looks like they've been they've been. Uh, cut with roman swords you know really wow yeah it's it's pretty wild so before we get on to science explains uh question uh very generously contributed thank you for that um uh what i i heard i'm sure i am i am i wrong here i i didn't read about it but i saw some headlines about how whether the Qumran caves were like a, uh, the whole settlement was was about a yearly and annual sort of celebration. S something to do with that? If you, do, you, do you have any knowledge of that, or am oh. I getting the wrong place? Um, I mean, there are a variety of of thoughts as to the connection between the site and the manuscripts themselves. Um, the the current consensus is something called the Granigan hypothesis, which which holds basically that this was a group of um, ascetic uh Essenes yeah uh which was one of the uh one one of the 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 Jewish worldviews or philosophies that that Josephus describes as well as uh Pliny um in their writings and uh they um sorry I lost my uh my train of thought here yeah so uh, the so the the site itself um is thought to be part of this it, it was thought to be part of this purification process something that the the writers and the collectors of the dead sea scrolls were were really really concerned about was ritual purity and um going out into the wilderness living at this site um was part of that requirement where they would uh they they would undergo this this ritual purification in preparation for the the battle at the last days and one of the other things that they they believe fiercely was that in the battle of the last days they would actually be enlisted uh to fight along with the forces of god so they would actually fight alongside of the angels of uh of god against the the forces of darkness and so for that reason uh it required just an intense uh form of ritual purification just to be even in the presence of actual angels right so this was also a group that was uh, appears to have been disenfranchised from the Jerusalem uh, temple establishment. 
uh, and they were, you know, fiercely opposed to the group uh, that was running uh, the temple at this period of time. And in compensation for this, they also held to um, an idea of a celestial temple, similar to what we see in uh, in the book of Ezekiel. And it appears that uh, part of part of their their ritual was regular uh, entrance in to and worship in this in this uh, celestial temple. We have lots of uh, descriptions of uh, of worshiping in uh, the temple of the heavens alongside again uh, the angels. It's all really it really makes, fascinating. Do you know what? It makes you realize that no cult in the history of humanity has ever had a successful existence. You know, and all cults seem to oh. say this is what's going to happen. And it never yeah. happens. Like it's true. The, the, so the moral of the story is don't start a cult because inductively, we use inductive reasoning, chances are it ain't gonna work. But there you go. So uh, science explains says, and thank you so much for this incredibly generous contribution. You are all wonderful people. Thank you. Or at least I have no idea really who you are, and you could all be very generous people. people. Yes, that, that's what I meant. <laughs> very generous people. Which is wonderful. Which is in itself wonderful. Thank you for helping me there. I was just going to accuse everyone of being mass murdering like despots or something. Um, so is there good evidence that any of the books in the Septuagint, and it might be worth just oh. giving a bit of the myth of the Septuagint uh, as well as explaining, you know, how it supposedly came to be, used earlier Hebrew text sources than the texts, uh, than the Hebrew texts that have been discovered so far. Uh, if you can sort of make sense this, of that. This is a terrific question. And yes. Um so the the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, legend holds that uh, that seventy Jewish scholars were were gathered um, by the, uh, uh, the 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 king of um, Egypt, uh, Ptolemy. Uh, I'm going to get this wrong. It was either Ptolemy one or two. Um, and you know these seventy Jewish scholars were gathered together and instructed to write a Greek translation of their uh, Hebrew text, and this was intended to go into you know the great repository of uh, of international knowledge that Ptolemy was was working at compiling. Uh, the legend goes that uh, each individual uh, Jewish scribe sat down and was working on his own. Uh, translation and the translations all miraculously um, supported one another and and matched perfectly as a, a sign of the divine origins of the text. What we uh, what we actually discover and and what what scholars actually you mean that hold, didn't that wasn't what happened? Oh, okay. I don't know. It, I mean it might have happened, but uh, how confident are we that it happened? Uh, no, I. Most aren't very confident. So, and one of the reasons for this is because there is no, there is no single uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew text. There are a variety of competing Greek translations of the Hebrew text. And there's also um, no good evidence. There, there's also evidence that suggests that the, the whole text was not just translated in one place at one time, but individual biblical books were were translated into Greek at various points along the way. And some of them, um, well, no, I shouldn't say that. Uh, so uh, to address the question at hand from the uh, from Science Explains, uh, so there are dramatic differences between some of the uh, the Greek translations and the, the Hebrew texts that are uh, largely preserved in what's called the... the uh, Masoretic text is is sort of the standardized Hebrew text. So there's dramatic differences between the Masoretic text and some of the Greek translations. Most notably, uh, the Book of Jeremiah in the uh, Masoretic text is some thirty percent longer than the um, the than the Septuagint version of Jeremiah, and it's uh, it, it it shows a. a dramatically different order of the uh of the book than what we see in the greek text um so scholars have suggested for a long time now that what you have going on in something like the book of jeremiah is you know 
an updating or a, a competing version. Most hold that the Septuagint version was the earliest, um, the earliest form of the text. And it was, you know, at a later point in time, updated uh, to what what is reflected in the uh, Hebrew text. One of the one of the things that uh, takes place in the in the Masoretic update and calling it Masoretic is really anachronistic because there's actually, you know, this is actually a very, very old form of the text. But one of the one of the things that appears in the update is a much stronger sympathy for uh, the nation of Babylon and a much, uh, uh, a much, sorry, no, I, I, I got to say that over again. What, one of the things I get this confused. One of the things that shows up in the, sorry, that's my dog in the uh, Masoretic version, this updated version is a much stronger, uh, fiercer criticism of the nation of Babylon. Um, where in the Septuagint version, Babylon is presented much more sympathetically, and most of the uh, most of the criticism is is or, or the strongest criticism is more more fiercely directed towards the nation of Egypt. So this is one of these these really interesting things that takes place in the update. Um, scholars had long suspected that uh, these Greek uh, translations were based on forms of the Hebrew text that no longer survived. And one of the really exciting things uh, that we have discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls is actual Hebrew versions uh, that are behind some of these Greek translations. So, you know, there are six copies of the book of Jeremiah uh, that were discovered at Qumran. And three of them uh, appear to closely reflect the Masoretic version of Jeremiah, the later version. But three of them, written in Hebrew, actually appear much, much closer to the Septuagint. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, they have been tremendously valuable for helping, for for validating a lot of these earlier scholarly theories, but also for helping us to see with much greater clarity um, the relationship between the 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 texts, the text of the Septuagint to the uh, the Masoretic text, and you know the the sources behind that. I hope that answered. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so what I wanted, I was going to get on to the pierced uh, Psalm 22, and actually someone's just mentioned uh -huh. about Matthew's Parthenos and Alma, but we'll get on to that. Oh, I, sure. do, I don't know if we've got time. Because I'm writing a book on the Exodus, right? It's yes. part of my trilogy of books to do with, you know, to follow on from the Nativity, a critical examination, everyone should go out and buy that, uh, and the Resurrection, a critical examination, and everyone should go out and buy that. Like, that's just a simple fact. Or of the matter um and <laughs> uh, uh i'm writing one in the exodus right and which is looking at how uh the exodus didn't happen historically it didn't happen uh moses wasn't a person or if he was he's nothing about him is is remotely connected to the original kernel that might have been there that as reported in 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 the tanakh uh in the hebrew bible so what can the because a brief history of the Hebrew Bible is that there were oral sources and things passed down, uh, different, maybe some written sources as well, until maybe some things were written down before the exile. Uh, and then during the exile, which is in, what, five 600 BCE, around that time. Uh, About 600. The, yeah, the Jews were exiled in, into uh, Babylonia. Uh, theory would be that they decided to create their own national identity by writing a holy text that represented their, them as a national e exiled people. Uh, so therefore, things like the Exodus is really important because that represents people in exile. And then there's also like appropriating stories from their surrounding cultures and the culture within which they are exiled to to create some na national mythology and national identity. And then this is added to post-exile uh, and actually really, I, some people argue, quite late into, you know, approaching, you know, 300, 200 BCE, uh, that the then becomes the 
the the Hebrew Bible eventually is a standalone thing. So that's a brief sort of history. You may like want to pick holes in that, but but how how the Exodus is is a is a pivotal part of, mm -hmm. of the Jewish identity and yeah. the Hebrew Bible. It leads towards the, the the law, and the law is the entire existence of the Hebrew Bible. I would argue. So, yeah, what what can the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us about the Exodus? If anything, tell us about you know anything to do with that. About the uh, about the historical uh, roots of the tradition of the Exodus. Unfortunately, the Dead Sea Scrolls can't tell us much. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because you know the the text that we the the source material that that we would want uh, to inform us about um, about the period of formation of the the Hebrew Bible and and of the the transition from an and a Canaan Isra Canaanite Israelite religion into uh, early Judaism we just don't have those um, the like I said you know the earliest texts we have come from the Hellenistic period or the earliest manuscripts I should say um which so, what, what sort of time frame would that be so yeah like uh after after the time of alexander so like 300 bc yeah. um we do have some we have some really interesting stuff from um um some interesting um documentary uh texts from elephantine in egypt that date as far back as as the early 400s i believe are they some um, of the, the letters that yeah can... yeah exactly so these are and and these are these are fascinating because they are a um they're an archive of a a community of uh yahweh worshiping jewish um mercenaries living in elephantine in egypt um and basically uh hiring themselves out as muscle to the uh to the rulers there uh during this during this period in the in in the Persian period essentially uh, and it is fascinating because they actually built themselves uh like a like a temple of uh worship to Yahweh but they were also you know polytheistic and accommodating uh worship of Egyptian gods alongside of Yahweh so so that all that to say and and we don't really have a lot of um scriptural source material from there but we have a lot of really interesting information on what Jewish life was like during the Persian period. Um, so I will, all that to say, uh, we don't have the kind of source material that we would want to, to show us clearly, um, you know, the historical roots of, of the Exodus in this, in this formation of national identity, but what the Dead Sea Scrolls do provide for us and relative to this question is insight into how these traditions did develop and uh, were transmitted in written form. There's a couple of fairly interesting uh, manuscripts uh, from Qumran uh, with regards to this uh, question. One of the most intriguing is, um, is for Cupaliod Exod M, which is a manuscript containing the text of Exodus, um, but in the Paleo Hebrew script. So this is not in the not in the square script the Aramaic script that we're most familiar with. This is the the early Hebrew um, script that was used, um, we believe, well, yeah, it was used in, in, the, uh, in the Iron Age before the exile. And we have a few of these uh, Paleo-Hebrew manuscripts that show up in the, uh, in, in the later period, like in the, in the second, first century BC, um, and it's thought that this is the reason for this is because it's a, it's a way of um, attempting to to promote um, Jewish nationalism through their own mm. their own script, their own language, instead of using, right. you know, the the Babylonian, uh, the Aramaic script. So so that's what we have here in this uh, one manuscript. And and what it kind of does is it provides us an example. I've got this is. Um, this is from a book by uh, Eugene Ulrich called The Dead Sea Scrolls and the Developmental Composition of the Bible, um, uh, which is a, a collection of a bunch of his his writings over the over 
uh, decades. Eugene Ulrich is a is a professor of uh, uh, Hebrew Bible textual criticism in the Dead Sea Scrolls at the University of Notre Dame. He's retired now, um, but it, this is this is from uh, one of the chapters in in this book where he talks about uh, pre scripture and uh, what the Dead Sea Scrolls can can tell us about the development of the text prior to them being quote unquote scripturized or becoming authoritative. And he uses as an example of this, um, the book of Exodus and in particular, some of the evidence that comes from, uh, this really interesting manuscript, uh, for Cupelia Exod M. So he says here, and I'll just read this. He, uh, he says it may prove helpful, uh, to present an example. He says source critics and redaction critics combined with text critics have identified about a dozen major stages in the development of the book of Exodus and their presumed purposes. So step stage one are the early memories of escape from Egypt. This, this uh, assumes that there is an historical kernel at the heart of the story somewhere in the very distant past. That's really inaccessible, you know, a, 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 a movement of uh, Semitic slaves out of Egypt into Palestine. Which some people, which to add to that, so that you get the Amarna letters, which are yeah. these letters that are sent, uh, is it the Amarna letters? But they're letters that are sent from an outpost in, yeah, these in, are... in, in, in Egypt, which yes. is sent back to, you know, it, the sent Pharaoh. To to, yeah. the, to the pharaoh to say we we have got some escaped slaves literally like one or two escaped slaves yeah. what should we do about them yeah. and, and it's this idea that that um that that this might literally be like the, that nugget of truth behind because some slaves there were some enslaved semitic people not not like a whole like bunch of people literally just a few yeah. slaves over time quite often and then occasionally they escaped but yeah. if you were to have, I mean, Joel Baden talks about this. If you were to have like one or two or just a small community of these people that at one point escaped and that becomes like your community's cultural story, then you can see that then over time, because no number of people ever get smaller. When you tell a story about exactly. anything, then no, no amount ever gets smaller. You know, the fish you caught will never get smaller. So therefore, the, these few people could become like the exodus exactly see exactly. that happen it's really as simple as this slaves escape from egypt all the time yeah. um and many of them semitic slaves ended up back in uh back in canaan and palestine and yeah and this is where this sort of exodus tradition developed and so uh ulrich says here these these memories were for the purpose to recall and pass on you know the memory of an important event uh, the second stage is that these are developed into a narrative in the Grundlage. Um, so this is like the the uh, the the early. Um, some would think it's an it's an oral tradition. Some might think this is sort of the first point when these come to be written down. And the purpose of this was to combine Egyptian with Canaanite origins for unity. Um, the third stage is the development of the Yahwist account of the Exodus. So um, this delves into the, the source theories for the formation of the Pentateuch, which recognize that it wasn't just written whole cloth uh, by Moses, but was actually compiled rather cleverly um, by a redactor much later in time from a variety of different uh, sources. So the Yahwist account is is identified by a number of scholars as one of those sources. Um, and the purpose of this was was the formation of a national epic to um, uh, speak to state origins, to celebrate where we came from. Uh, and likewise, the four stages, the development of the Yahwist account, another national epic. And the idea here is that the, the Yahwist account seems to have originated in the south in Judah. Mm -hmm. The Eloist epic seems to have originated in the north in the larger uh, uh, kingdom of Israel or Ephraim. Um, so yeah, uh, it, this is a national epic reformulated in the north after division. Mm -hmm. uh, the fifth stage is, the, the re is a redactor at some point combined J and E that's uh, the Yahwist and the Yellowist account. And the purpose for this 
was to resume a combined all Israel origins after the loss of the north. So um, the the kingdom of Israel or Ephraim was uh, was destroyed by Sennacherib in 722 BCE, and um, many many of these uh, of these people living there. Uh, emigrated south as refugees into Judah. There was like an explosion of the population down there during the time of Hezekiah. And there was also, from this period, I think all the way through, uh, up until the destruction of Herod's temple, there was this this uh, utopian ideal um, that, that the Israelite and later Jewish people had about a united kingdom, about a, a strong reunification of all the the, the tribes of Israel and the four, you know, the combination of the J and the E uh, accounts, according to this theory, play into that, into this idea that, you know, it's, it's good for us all to get back together. So the sixth stage is the P narrative. This is the priestly source of, uh, of the Pentateuch. And this is uh, for the purpose of post-destruction and re-theologizing the traditions. And this is the stage that occurs right at the, you know, at the exile in the exilic period of the Babylonian exile, when Judah and Jerusalem are are sacked and the temple is destroyed, um, the elite from the city are are sent to live in Babylon in exile, and for them, it's a period of reckoning and reformulation of many of their traditions. Added to this is the the P legal material in the seventh stage. At the eighth stage. The redactor then combined uh, the P with the J and E material uh, for the purpose to preserve all Israelite major versions. And uh, this comes to form the basic book of Exodus. So well into the uh, the exilic period. Now, here's where we encounter the first actual textual evidence. Uh, in stage nine, the Hebrew forlaga of the old Greek in the Septuagint, which is quite different uh in for the book of exodus than it is from the uh the hebrew text especially um with regards to chapters 35 and 40 so this is this is sort of the earliest surviving form of the book of exodus that we have which appears in the uh in the old greek in the septuagint um and scholars are unanimous that this is based on an actual hebrew version uh of the text behind it that's different from the uh, Masoretic version. So following this is the formation of the Masoretic version of Exodus with revisions to chapter 35 to 40 uh, in an effort to match um, execution with commands. One of the problems in the Greek version is in the, the old Greek version is that there's some, there's, there's an inconsistency still present which reflects back on this earlier redaction period when sources were being combined and put together. Um, the Masoretic editor came along and and massaged those and 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 put a lot of helping information yeah, in because, there. Yeah, because because with the documentary hypothesis, <laughs> the, 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 there are different hypotheses concerning yeah. this, and then you get fragmentary and supplementary hypotheses. Yeah. But the 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 original hypothesis, you had four sources: J uh e d and p and now in i think in europe there's a movement to combine j and e or at least so not not combine but not they're not distinct individual yeah. uh narratives uh so it's more j and other stuff is that right and then sort of it's yeah and it's really really complex i think i think joel baden uh, said it best that like the documentary hypothesis is the simplest explanation for the sources behind the Pentateuch. What's happening in Europe is is something called the uh, well, there's a variety of things. There's the two source theory or there's the supplementary hypothesis or the fragmentary hypothesis, which which various scholars hold to, which basically hold to the ideas that, yeah, there were still sources behind the Pentateuch, but they're not these these four um, there might be two, there might be one that is continually updated and, and, and drawing in traditions over time. Yeah. So it's really complex and, and it doesn't really help to, to, to get into it here. No, no. So, so what, but where I was going to go with that is yeah. what you were saying, which is whether you think it's J E D P or yeah. J D and P with a little bit of whatever, 
but you also want need to put on top of that the, the the role of the redactor so it's not just that you have these sources and then and then they are just being put together neutrally or objectively yeah you've got these sources and this may happen a, a number of times is the redactor who has an agenda as much as those source writers have an exactly. agenda is 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 knitting these sources together uh so you have you know j for example i'm um, this is just saying you've got j uh, and e being redacted together so you've got like three sources then and then you might have someone redacting yeah. that with with the priestly source or whatever so you've got you've got these different redactor um uh, influences that are happening at various times which exactly. means that the multi the multiple source theories which is definitely there's a multiple source theory well, whatever your eventual theory is there's multiple sources that's the point it's not there Moses be, writing yeah. all this stuff down exactly but there are so many agendas going on uh, which uh, yeah. which you can only guess through inference and so it becomes detective work that, that you can only get have your best guess at, at exactly like, finally. and what we do have here so here's where we we have hard evidence here um of a a redaction in the masoretic text that's different from the old greek of the septuagint and this is exactly right like scholars have then been carefully analyzing the text to 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 develop ideas about what the point of the redaction is right so but this and this is something that 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 probably takes place in the uh you know, in the, in the three hundreds. Right. Um, so this is, this is pretty late. So after that, you've got this in really interesting manuscript, this far Paley at XOD M uh, discovered at Qumran. And so this is a revised edition beyond what we have in the Septuagint and in the Masoretic text. Um, it's a revised edition that adds expansions of biblical material so it's taking texts from elsewhere in the pentateuch like in deuteronomy and numbers and it's plugging those into the narrative of exodus as a way to harmonize it and to to smooth it over even more uh so all of this work is it's it's all about scribes and readers and and scholars doing their utmost to as carefully as they can fix the text there's a there's a strong focus through this whole redactional period and i would say this is what you know this is what the the, the purpose of redaction is in in the first place that that extends all the way into the very very distant past it's, it's all about fixing the text making it more palatable making it make more sense you know so this is what's going it's, on it's a, so you've got to think it's a it's a human thing going on here so yeah. whenever any any whenever any human does anything you have an objective what am i trying to achieve so with me and you doing this video, we've got our objectives about what we're trying to achieve in life, right? By doing this, or in, not in life, in this moment, in this uh, in this task. So when you're a redactor, it, what you're not doing is just, do you know what? I'm going to put these sources together and just, the, and there they are, the sources together. The redactor is going to be thinking, right, what am I doing here? I am presenting, I've got an objective, right? And I have yeah. these these ingredients that are going to help me perform my objective. And thank you, those are the ingredients, right? I am now trying to do something. So the, the question is, what is the redactor trying to do here in at any point in this redactional process? Uh, but 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 it's the idea that, that, that we sometimes we forget that humans are doing mm. things. Do you know what I mean? We just think exactly. Here's a text. Yeah. Here's here's a thing that's come from God. Therefore, it's true or whatever. And you're like, yeah. oh, no. What was really going on here? And what 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 can I guess was the intention of this person putting these two things together, or three things, or whatever things together? And how can I how can I evidence my my hypothesis about what his intentions were? through some of the little hints in in the text by, by right. comparing this with with the sources before that they they were redacted if i can if at all i can or or by guessing what the sources were and what 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 the redactor has has added to those sources exactly you know right I mean? yeah so that i mean this is all about just basically trying to trace the origins and the development of the text and you know in the final the final two stages after for at xm you've got the uh, the writing of the Samaritan Pentateuch, which was based on that text, but then even uh, developed it further with a stronger emphasis on Mount Gerazim, 
for the uh, the existing Samaritan community, right? And then even beyond that, you've got something called uh, there's a there's another manuscript or or a handful of manuscripts covered in the Dead Sea Scrolls called Four Q Pentateuch, which is a a much further developed version of uh, of of the the Torah text with even more uh, attempts at harmonization and at, at at explanation and expansion of the text. And all of this is because yes, people are recognizing it all. All of this is working towards this idea that um, these texts are sacred, but we also can see this: the, the scribes who are, are are recognizing the sacredness of the text can also see the problems, right, and the inconsistencies and the places where they don't they don't mesh up. So they're trying to fix those, and it 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 takes place over this long period of of ongoing editing and redaction and it really tells us too something that 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 i think it, it 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 informs us about and is very very important is we have to get away from thinking about the biblical text like it's this fixed thing mm. in this period of time not at all in fact all the evidence that we have at hand suggests very strongly to us that scribes and scholars of the period, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about this period of time here, um, you know, during the rule of the Hasmoneans up to, you know, Herod and the Roman period in the time of Jesus, uh, they all felt a good deal of freedom uh, and liberty to make dramatic changes to the text in order to suit their own purposes, in yeah. order to make the most sense that they could. Which text. is what we under, which is what we understand by the rabbinic traditions of of Pesha and Midrash, and you know the the, under, the understanding that that people would be reinventing uh, pre existing stories to be more current for their particular audience, exactly. and therefore, uh, you know, fulfill an objective that they have in mind, and that was pretty standard fare. Um, and and yeah, as far as the Christians and 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 Jews are concerned, with regard to you know the 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 Pentateuch or the or the Tanakh as it's as it's created. Mm -hmm. The question is how much was written in the exedic period. It seems to be that that's 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 the battleground. I think maybe right. not for you and but or, or whatever, but but I think in terms of skeptics versus religious people, it, it's like Okay, so the traditional literalist will say Moses wrote it all down mm -hmm. a long time ago, even though he wrote about his own death and even though he's calling himself the most humble person in the world, you know, and all these kind of weird things. Um, so th that happened there. Um, my video is obviously just frozen. And then, um, uh -oh. uh, but it's all right, you can hear my beautiful voice. I still. can. Is that, uh, excellent. So, yeah. uh, so you have this argument over, okay, well, how much is written in the exilic period? Uh, and how much wasn't uh, and skeptics are trying to put and um, not just trying to put the evidence seems to be pointing towards the fact that it was written in the exilic period at least largely and 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 thereafter and i and i think you know that that's where that's where the the battle is taking place i think that's that's a fair that's a fair uh, uh summary of the situation yeah yeah, yeah uh so do you have anything to add to that because i'm just going to mention the elephantine um uh, uh text in a minute um it's going going to my wrong camera for some reason but there you uh -oh. go okay no i think that's i think that's good and i think um just you know one i just want to stress one of the one of the things that the dead sea scrolls have really helped us with tremendously is to to show us examples of how this this redactional activity took place and how people how people were were reading and interpreting and transmitting their so-called sacred uh scriptures so did you want to talk about um oh you wanted to say something about the elephantine um papyri yes, I, you know you have to deal with me in 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 crappy uh laptop can for the moment because you know <laughs> technology is my friend um so <laughs> i just because i think this is yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. um so uh, it's so important i think the elephantine papyri uh and i'm just reading from an old blog post i did crucially the elephantine papyri of 650 bce are hugely problematic for pentateuchal claims the first five 
books of the Bible being written by Moses. Mm. They are silent on the existence of the Pentateuch or any part of it. The priesthood being related in any way to Aaron or, or Levites, um, Jewish names found in the Pentateuch. There are over 160 Jews mentioned in the papyri, not one with a Pentateuchal name. Any That's biblical true. history of the Jews, such as the Exodus or of the tribes or of any prophets, any knowledge of the laws of Moses or any other authoritative writing. They show also that the Jews at the time and the Jerusalem priesthood had no knowledge of the contents of the Pentateuch, both following practices contrary to its injunctions, no knowledge of a written Torah or Pentateuch, no knowledge of names of figures in the Pentateuch, but clear knowledge of a Jerusalem priesthood with all religious authority and knowledge of a Jerusalem temple priesthood supporting another temple and altars of sacrifice, as well as non-Levitical priests. Again, this offers massive support for the Pentateuch being written later even than this so late in 650 bce and yeah. the claims therein not being crafted out of existing knowledge and stories and history of the jewish people as reported in the pentateuch so i you know i think i think the the, the elephantine papyri are massively massively important for destroying any notion that that the sort that not only was destroying the notion that the pentateuch was written early but it also destroys the notion that there were written and widely available sources either oral or written that are making the claims that you can find within the pentateuch some the, the most fundamental claims yeah i would i would it's agree not. in part to that but i think we should probably set our stress on the availability of these things because um what i i think what what uh are you still there jonathan uh oh um, yeah, oh, yeah. there he is. Just, You're coming just back. Just normally flashing back. I'm trying to get my camera back on. Okay. Um, I think I I think what uh, what what most scholars will uh, will will tell us is that um, the the sources within the Hebrew Bible themselves these are the texts that belong to just the very like just the 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 small very very small minutia. Uh, smattering of 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 the um, the elites connected to the Jerusalem Temple, um, you know, prior to the uh, prior to the exile, uh, we have to we have to understand the Jerusalem Temple not so much as as this this national sanctuary, but based on uh, the archaeological remains of similar uh, temple palace. Uh, uh, constructions from the same period. This was more of like a royal chapel. The the Jerusalem Temple was inextricably connected to uh, the 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 throne of uh, of Jerusalem, the 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 House of David, um, and these are the people for whom the texts were written. This was not for the nation i'm talking about prior to the exile in the pre-exilic period you know what literature there was that was there was the property of the elites and i think this is this this one of the ways one of the ways we can explain why there's just total ignorance of of all of this material within uh the elephantine jewish community is because obviously these were not people who were connected to the royal house and to this very small segment of of uh of the elites so it just it provides us a much much more expansive view of what religion what early canaanite religion early israelite religion looked like in the uh in the pre-exilic period and it informs us about the origins of judaism which you know came mm. to came to be the dominant form yeah. of uh, this religious expression at around the same time that the New Testament was written. So thank you for that. It's brilliant. Um, the, the last area I want to talk about before we wrap things up is going back to a question that came up earlier, which, and um, by the way, thanks to Gnostic Informant who threw out a contribution. Neil, oh. you're a legend. What a lovely guy. Uh, but he's Fantastic. having a right old shindig, right old argument in the, uh, in the, in the comments thread with uh, your way or Yahweh. Oh, he's a big fan of mine. 
yeah yeah this, i think uh, he's been having a go at you but you know um, you know words whatever um so the 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 idea and, and i talked about this a lot in my resurrection book i'm going to try and sort my camera out in a minute when uh, dr kip has a has a chat with you and i'll just fill around my camera and just okay. imagine i don't exist um so in in the resurrection a critical examination i talk in the in the uh, chapter on on profit or so-called prophecies about psalms 29 69 loads of different psalms supposedly prophesizing jesus uh but psalm 22 says for dogs have surrounded me a band of evil doers has encompassed me they pierced my hands and my feet now this is a really interesting uh supposed prophecy because what it shows is that the gospel authors i can't remember is it john here that that is uh that is trying to uh quote mine i mean we associate quote mining with matthew actually so mm -hmm. but the, the, he's going back into the old testament and saying look here's psalm 22 this is clearly prophesied prophesying jesus because his hands be you know being pierced uh well but, in actual fact but, i would, uh, what I I would say, say is, okay go I, ahead. I, I, so just to just to give the preamble which is that the, they're relying on the septuagint translation which is a greek translation of the the original hebrew which may or may not be getting the pierced part right or wrong and and the and so critics will say actually if we look at the original hebrew uh text or words used it's not pierced this is a mistranslation and christian or, or the gospel writers are wrong to say this is prophetic in fact it's a right cock up because their prophecy is based on a mistranslation it's just like parthenos uh, virgin yep. uh, 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 but then recently and you've talked about this before as uh, like a scholar who, who used to be your teacher said actually no i found a Maz uh, i found a hebrew text in the in the dead sea scrolls that that actually shows that it does mean pierced and it doesn't mean pinned or lions pinning or, or whatever the the actual original uh, Hebrew was. But then you've gone back and said, well, oh, this is not quite the conclusion I would have derived from from this. Could you just basically explain far better than I have <laughs> what the issue is? And I'm going to sort my video out. Certainly. Well, to start, I think it's important to point out that while um, the gospel writers drew extensively on Psalm 22, not one of them ever clearly alludes to this verse and i think the reason for that is because they didn't know this uh this 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 greek reading um so what i will i'll just i'll unpack this as best i can what is happening here in verse 17 the the masoretic form as jonathan said uh says literally like a lion my hands and my feet and it's a it's kind of a frustrating a uh, bit of bit of uh, a text here because there's no verb um so there's there's been the suggestion of textual corruption for some time precisely because there is no verb but you know then on the other side of this this is not especially uncommon in in hebrew poetry there's plenty 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 of uh of places throughout the uh hebrew bible and poetical texts that have a frustrating lack of verbs and um so just within the original context, what's taking place here, this is a psalm uh, in which the, the speaker is experiencing some, some extreme distress. He is under attack. He is, uh, he is, he is being humiliated and, and physically abused by, by his tormentors. And at this point in the passage, he says, like a lion, my hands on my feet. Uh, he says, dogs surround me. Uh, like a lion, my hands and my feet. Basically, what he's getting at here is that uh, it seems like he's describing a lion attack of some sort, and uh, the 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 fuller uh, expression of what he's saying is they've attacked me like a lion, um, and basically devoured me, and all that's left are my hands and my feet, or you know they've 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 taken my hands and feet right off. Um, later on in the passage, he talks about being literally dismembered. He says that I can count my bones. Um, you can only do that if you're, yeah. you know, if you're spread out all over the ground. So um, this is what's going on in this psalm. Heaven, heaven forfend you should read the entire psalm to, to, to derive its meaning <laughs> um, rather than you know, just right? pick out the odd verse. And I got to point out, too, the uh, the presence of lions is is rather replete throughout the entire psalm they're they're all over the place in there so i mean it's it's a it's a a a translation and it's a it, it's it's an interpretation that makes perfect sense just 
on the face of it. So yeah. what happened here? Um, the Septuagint translation reads, um, I think it's Horuksan uh, Kaipodos, uh, which literally means they dug, as in, you know, like, like digging mm -hmm. in the ground, my hands and my feet. Um, it's it's a strange that's a strange way of describing any kind of impalement in the first place. If you want to imagine that this is nails going into into the hands of the feet, which I've I've seen I've I've literally seen theists defend this translation by saying that you are digging into hands with a nail like that, and it's like yeah. you, this, you don't. What? You don't ever see this translation, this usage of the same word anywhere else in the text. Every single place where it's used, it's always with reference to digging a grave or digging a pit. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is this is the problem. Um, I don't think, uh, in my personal opinion, when I look at the, like when I look at the Septuagint translation, the Greek translation, it looks to me like the translator either can't read the Hebrew properly or he's reading a text and misunderstand. He's he's seeing something there or not seeing something there. Something is is ambiguous or odd within the text. Which and and he's doing his best to try and and come up with a with a Greek word to correspond to what he's seeing there. And this is where where uh, this particular manuscript from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the so-called Nachal Hever Scroll. Uh, which was actually covered, uh, discovered at um, at the site of Nachal Hever, and it's uh, about mid second century. It wasn't found at Qumran. One of the fragments preserves this uh, this section of the text, and it's pretty badly chewed up. It's not that easy to read on the face of it. Um, but I'm I'm re reasonably convinced that Peter Flint has the reading right here. So basically, what he has said is this word, which is translated. Uh, like a lion, ka'ari, it uh, it looks like kof, alef, resh, yod. Um, in this particular manuscript, the Nachal Hever scroll, it appears as kof, alef, resh, vav. Um, without getting into it, in lots of early Jewish manuscripts, it was very, very easy to confuse yods with vavs because they looked almost identical. Not always. But lots of times they did. And I think that's probably what happened with this manuscript, is there was a confusion of this last letter between a Vav and a Yod. So what, what Professor Flint uh, thought with regards to this passage was that this word, Kof Aleph Resh Vav, which on its own does not mean anything. It needs to be stressed that this word, as it appears is not translatable. So what uh, what Professor Flint suggested was that the Aleph there uh, was actually a helping vowel. There are a handful of letters in Hebrew, uh, Aleph, Yod, Vav, um, sometimes Ayan, but but not often, you know, were, were inserted in some manuscripts into the text as a way of helping the pronunciation of the word. Um, this is before the time that uh, of of vowel pointing in the uh, in in the later medieval period, uh, scribes developed a system of dots and dashes that they would put underneath the words, which would indicate the correct vowel sound that you attach to the letter. Um, in the original text, there's none of these. So, in a number of manuscripts, lots of them from Qumran, we see instances where vowel letters. Uh, have been inserted into the text as a way of helping pronunciation. So Professor Flint suggested that this olive is a helping vowel uh, inserted into the text for the purposes of pronunciation. And the word itself is actually keiru, which is a verb and means they dug. So here we have an example of a manuscript that actually preserves a Hebrew form of the word that explains how the translator of the Septuagint arrived at his translation. That's what we have. This is what virtually every scholar agrees upon. Now, the question with regards to this particular manuscript and this particular passage is which trans which translation or which word 
Keru or Ka'ari is the original to the uh, the text. And I, I believe that most scholars still hold that the Ka'ari, like a lion, is the original uh, is the original word uh, that was used. Like a lion, my hands and my feet, not they dug my hands and my feet. Uh, Professor Flint has suggested the opposite. He has suggested that the original reading based on this scroll looks like it was Keru, um, that the, the scribe on this scroll um, you know, added this helping vowel, uh, and that later on, this was then changed by maybe by Jewish scribes who were embarrassed about how closely this aligns with uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. Maybe they're the ones who came along and later changed it to Ka'ari and turning this verse into something that, uh, that really wasn't all that sensible. So that's the argument that he's making. How do we determine who's right here? Um, I have suggested that just on the basis of the context of the psalm, the frequent usage of the, the, the word lion throughout Psalm 22, the, um, the frequent frustrating lack of, of Hebrew verbs in Hebrew poetical texts, all these things point rather convincingly to the Ka'ari being the original reading. And the one uh, aspect of this argument that most people miss and really should pay closer attention to is within this specific manuscript, within the Nachal Hever Psalm scroll, um, if this is uh, a, a form of Keru with a helping vowel Aleph, then what we should expect is we should expect to see these same sorts of forms strewn throughout the manuscript. And the reason for this is this. Uh, when it came to spelling, in antiquity, while it was certainly not fixed, um, Hebrew spelling was certainly not fixed. These vowel letters were added all the time to various manuscripts. It needs to be stressed that this is manuscript specific. And what I mean by that is when a Hebrew scribe writing, you know, in the second temple period employed helping vowel letters or longer spelling, they did so throughout the whole manuscript. Yeah. So we'd see it all over the place. But if they didn't, then likewise, we almost never saw it. And of course, this is that it's on a spectrum. You know, some manuscripts contain tons of vowel letters and have very long spelling for, for many things. Some manuscripts, you know, contain almost no vowel letters or, or helping letters. Uh, some sort of fit in the middle where there's some, but, you know, not not a lot. Uh, so what we really need to do when looking at this reading is we need to ask the question, what is the spelling convention being used by the scribe who wrote this manuscript? And uh, it's interesting to me that, that, that Peter Flint came out as strongly as he did in favor of this being the original reading because he did the, he did the editorial work on this particular manuscript. And in his own description, of the manuscript in the introduction, he says that the spelling is extremely defective, even more so than the Masoretic text. So basically what he's saying here is this Nachal Hever scroll has very, very short spelling conventions and, and almost no vowel letters anywhere. So with all that in hand, we have to say, you know, if if the character of this manuscript is towards short spelling, then we should understand this particular reading in those same terms. This is almost certainly not a long spelling of the word because the scribe didn't use long spelling. Um, so what I would say, I'll, I'll repeat myself here again, what happened here is a scribe uh, was looking at this word, ka'ari, um, and most likely on a manuscript where the vowel, the vavs and the yods looked almost identical to one another. And he mistook ka'ari, kof alaf resh yod, for kof alaf resh vav. And that's what he ended up transcribing. And then the, uh, the Septuagint translator encountered a manuscript like this and just basically translated the mistake. Yeah. And I'll, you know, on its own, ka, Keru as a verb, even when it's spelled correctly, does not mean pierced. 
it means digging yeah. in the ground. So, and finally, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about this. If this was the original reading, Keiru, they dug my hands on my feet or they pierced my hands on my feet. If this was understood by uh, by by the, the Jews who were, were transmitting these texts at the time of Jesus, at the time of the writing of the New Testament, then it seems practically impossible that it would have been completely neglected by virtually every single New Testament writer who never once cites this verse. So it's just, it seems like, uh, it, well, it seems pretty, you know, a case closed to me that, that this is this is uh, a Septuagint getting it wrong and then the gospel writers using the Septuagint to to trawl through the the Old Testament to cherry pick some verses that they can throw at Jesus and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. In this case, the verse doesn't stick because they're using an incorrect translation. And I would it sounds like that that is despite the best intentions of, of apologists or in this case a Christian yeah. Uh, scholar, you know, which who's otherwise a very good scholar, and you, you have you remember him fondly. But uh, mm -hmm. you, it's like you know, people make mistakes, and people have agendas, and then people might make mistakes because they have agendas. I don't know. exactly right. But exactly. Um, right. now, there's so I will say there's so there's one other manuscript uh, at Qumran which preserves part of this uh, uh, this same verse. Um, and Peter Flint edited this manuscript as well. And in the place where where we see this word, uh, it appears at the bottom of a fragment or a kind of a transition between two fragments. And all you see, there are some little bits of ink. And he basically suggests the reading Kedu without the uh, without the olive. Um, but on the basis of the surviving material, and you can go and look at the photographs for yourselves. They're all online. Yeah. Uh, there's just nothing there. Um, you wouldn't come to that same conclusion. No, no, not even no. close. Like, I mean, when I look at, when I look at the, the remaining material there, I, I just don't see how you can even, how you can go one way or the other with regards to what the, what yeah. the reading is. There just simply isn't enough evidence. Yeah. So it's, um. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's uh that's Psalm 22. Uh one more thing I want to point out here is it, it's often and I'm doing there's going to be a video I I'm in a video with um uh, uh helping uh Paulo Gia finish up his uh his series on uh, Lee Strobel's Christmas videos. So I get into a lot of uh the the messianic prophecy in that one. Everyone should certainly check it out. Um but uh one of the things that I mentioned in that video and I think bears bears repeating all over the place is this is not something nefarious that that uh you know christian uh writers the new testament writers were doing by you know mining the old testament and cherry picking these these prophecies and applying them to themselves and to jesus uh, this is just in the period um this is just good bible exegesis this is what jewish uh readers of the text did they took yeah. these ancient scriptures and they they started to think about them like secret coded messages about who about applied to themselves in their in their current circumstances in their own time. So what it um, might be a good idea to have is loads of examples of where they've done this and got it wrong. Oh, or, well, or done this in like misapplied stuff and it's just forgotten in the annals of time. For history. sure. Or even the same passage interpreted two different ways by two different groups, and we have examples of that. For example, uh, the uh, um, Isaiah—I think it's Isaiah 40, verse three—is uh, is applied by the New Testament, right, by the Gospel writers, uh, as as a prophecy of the arrival of Elijah, a voice crying in the wilderness, "Prepare the way for the coming of Yahweh." You're familiar with this, right? Right. Uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see the same passage used by this other group of uh, of of uh, 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 Jews, but with an entirely different meaning. They read the passage, uh, a voice crying out, "Go into the wilderness and prepare a 
uh, uh, and prepare for the coming of Yahweh. So basically what they're doing is they're applying the same passage to themselves as a legitimation for their uh, those their sojourn out to the Judean desert yeah. to await the uh, the coming of uh, the coming of Yahweh. And and the Dead Sea Scrolls are loaded with these sorts yeah. of examples of uh, of Bible exegesis. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's um, wild. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I have to shoot off because uh, I've got uh, yeah. I can hear children just parading, <laughs> just like charging about. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure and a it privilege has. to speak to you, Dr. Kip. Uh, um, but before we before we sort of wrap up and say where can people find you, quick fire question and answer round. Hey, yeah. Okay, what's your favorite nonfiction book? My favorite nonfiction book. Yeah. Oh. God. <laughs> what, the Bible? Uh, no, 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 no. That's that's not a that's a fiction book. Uh, wow. Sorry that that one kind of came out. Well, my favorite one uh, right now is probably I'm reading I'm reading um, one right now about um, the uh, the Levitical priesthood. Uh, where is it? I mean, you know, be, you're talk, you know you're bedside. talking to a geek. Oh, yeah. You know you're talking yeah, yeah. to a geek. Sorry. You say, what's your favorite non-fiction book? <laughs> you know, okay. Well, I'm reading this book upon, uh, on the Le 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 Levitical Yeah, principles. And it's always oh, changing, right. guys. I, you know, I'm, that's all I read is non-fiction. So, yeah. yeah. Fair so well, so, of, so, sorry about okay. that. You that haven't answered that question. But that's <laughs> zero from one. Um, favorite fiction book, but apparently you don't read any. So, I don't read. so but I did. Once upon yeah. a time, and there are ones that there are a few that I really, really love. Um, one of my favorites was uh, was Yan Martel's The Life of Pi. Yeah, I love that book. Um, good Canadian book. Um, mm -hmm. I also, as as a kid, I loved uh, I loved Lord of the Flies. Um, I love. I was uh, in the Lord of the Flies play as a kid. Oh, right, who did you get I, to play? I just, I ju just a random school kid who uh, oh. just runs around on stage going, kill the pig, spill his blood, kill the pig, spill his blood. And that's it. That's all I did. Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, so uh, favorite atheist advocate. So favorite atheist oh, out there. My favorite atheist advocate. So I'm going to give a plug here for um, uh, Ben, the amateur exegete who is uh this is he, he runs a youtube channel and he has a blog called the amateur exegete uh it's very small uh so he's a guy who's got some uh uh some some training in uh in biblical studies and he's very very sober-minded in his approach uh and he does a lot of fantastic videos and and uh blog entries about uh, how to properly use the sources he does book reviews um he does critiques not just of uh uh apologists but he's actually going through a really great series right now um where he's looking at uh at popular memes uh by atheists nice. and deconstructing seeing, those seeing and saying, hold up. yeah oh, this is nonsense oh, so um nice. It's a it's a great great channel. Please go support Ben the Amateur Exegy. He does not get nice enough credit out. for what he's doing. So okay, question four. I've seen loads of thumbnails of you, like with an Iron Maiden T-shirt on. Oh, so, yeah. what's your favorite Iron Maiden album and song? Oh yeah! Come on, quick. Oh okay. So my favorite Iron Maiden album is Brave New World. Oh. And uh, my favorite was that, Iron was Maiden new, was that with that new singer. No, no, this was oh, after okay. this was after Blaze. This was okay. the first right. album with uh, with uh, Bruce Dickinson, Dickinson after he came back. Right. Um, it's my favorite album though. It's fantastic, and I think it's hard to pick a favorite song. I have to admit, but I'm you know Run to the Hills, Hallow Be Thy Name, uh, oh, Seventh Son nice. of the Seventh Son, um, uh, Wicker Man. I, God, I mean where. I sorry. Okay, so <laughs> well, just out of interest, you were wrong on both answers because it was peace of mind and the best song is Revelations. But you know, oh, you, it's fine. You can you can have. Okay. You can, I'll, but how do I'll you pick? You know really? Yeah, how it do is you? Really it's difficult. hard. 
when oh. I was just watching some Rock in Rio like live versions of some of those songs, oh, it's just like how many people can you fit in one area? Just actually, this is like a religion. Just no working. kidding, eh? How many times have so, you seen them live? Uh, somewhere between zero and one. Oh, oh zero, yo. that's it. I oh. haven't got to them, but anyway. Oh, so la- the Last Supper. So if that. if you yeah, if you were if you were to have a last meal, what would it be? A last meal. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I thought I was going to have a quick answer, but now I have to think about it. Um, it would, it would probably, it would probably be, be German actually. Um, it would probably like be you a good, Schwein- German. No, no. <laughs> it'd probably be like a good Schweinhocks, which is like a, like a pig's knuckle. Um, and some, uh, uh, some Spätzle. Uh, with gravy and uh, Weinkraut. So, <laughs> I mean, all of those are wrong again, especially as I'm a vegan, but you know. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, it definitely well, would, would comprise of tons and tons and tons of meat. I, yes. I, I'm, see, I'm a vegan because I got, I've got, for those who don't know, I've got primary progressive multiple sclerosis, and you either mm. can take a paleo diet or a vegan diet to try and like keep your, keep healthy to keep your MS in check. Uh, but now I've become a vegan, actually vegan plus fish, but now I've become, so not really a vegan. So now I've become a vegan, like I can still like morally hold it over other people because even though it's for health, like I could never bring myself to go that far until like I got MS. I was like, okay, better do it. Yeah. Uh, but now I can just pretend I did it for moral reasons and just be morally superior to everyone. So there that's you go. awesome. That's awesome for you. <laughs> And I, I am obviously a terrible person because I, I love meat and the, you know, the slaughter of, of farm animals just doesn't bother me enough to stop <laughs> loving meat. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm... That, so when I, I used what to write, I, when I used to, I write, wrote about this and I wrote about how I'm at the time I wasn't a vegetarian and I wasn't a vegan and I was trying to be more vegetarian. I was becoming flexitarian because I, I recognize the moral, uh, correctness of not eating meat but i Mm -hmm. like you're saying rather than try and justify eating meat by saying eating meat is good and here's why it's good and i've seen people do that seen people write essays that i'm like all you are doing is post-hoc rationalizing your Mm -hmm. choice what you should do is just say which is what i did which is say i'm imperfect and i don't i don't i like meat too much to uh, overcome my dislike of of the ramifications eating meat how's this i I am I am going to vegan hell and uh and I and I can't help myself. Okay, that, that's it. Fair enough. <laughs> uh but just to let you know, I am morally superior to you. Anyway, question number six. So uh you went to university at the University of Manchester. Yes, I university? did. So uh what's your favorite thing about the UK? Oh, my favorite thing about the UK? Uh when when I was in Manchester, I think it was yeah. live theater. So mm-hmm. good. It was so good. And um and pub life. Okay, live theater and pub life. That's good. Yeah. I like it. Two two quite interesting sort of different things. Right, final question. You can take three people into a bunker with you for, for an apocalypse that's gonna happen. It's gonna happen for a month, so maybe not forever, so just for a month. You, you can't take family members, so that's a oh, cop out. Okay. <laughs> like, come on, seriously. Uh, uh, you just end up having arguments and uh, like, yeah i no, i you know we wouldn't we would all not fit also <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes you can't take dogs either so uh <sighs> so you three people three people humans into the bunker who would it be wow anybody i want right so yeah alive current living yeah. well, no no actually no whoever can it be living or dead eh yeah okay uh, um uh, it would probably be uh um boy i would it would it would probably be um the priest hilkaya um who discovered the book of the law what in in the in the side of the temple and it's yep. like oh suddenly yep. this has come from if, god if that's thing. if that's something if there was a i, I tend to think there's a there's nice. a, histor- a, a real historical nice turtle to this so i i would pick him um and just because I want to know what the fuck was going on, sorry, what the hell was going on? Um, so I would pick him. Uh, I would probably pick the uh, the Emperor Augustine 
I would. Uh, I I'm allowed three. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, uh, it would be a tough choice between um probably uh, Martin Noth, the great uh, uh, the great biblical scholar from he, the uh, the he early talks, to mid talks about like oral traditions 20th and... century yeah yeah so it'd be it'd be a toss up between hand you between you are him you are a geek you've oh, just you've I'm gone sorry. to heaven it's like what three <laughs> people would you choose okay uh, 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 we'd, and we'd be and, we'd be quite uh we'd be quite a bunch wouldn't we in yeah. our uh, in our bunker unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately and here's a problem is that none of you would be able to understand each other but i just throw that one well out i i could i i think i could probably understand all of them oh, but maybe i'd be the only one check um, you <laughs> you'd be the like the interpreter yeah i would be so but I, i'm worried though that poor hilkiah would would probably just have a heart attack from from uh from fear yeah um what the hell is going on going on right so um but uh yeah okay we'll leave it at martin no um yeah brilliant sorry guys well <laughs> well look that, that thank you that was yeah. um i was expecting bruce dickinson to be in there but apparently not um yeah you know. i don't i'm you know i'll be honest i feel like i i i've he some of these people are such public figures i figure like i i know you as much as I, I can about them. And I guess for company, yeah, you know, I might, I might pick some, some different people and maybe, and I, I don't know if, if Bru I, I think I would, I would probably pick, uh, pick Nico McBain to be right, with me enough. as a, so, I, I just, as I just, he's a born again he's, Christian as well. I mean, he's an amazing drummer. But he's, but he's a, he's just a, he's just a wild freaky human being. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> he's kind of a I swear anyone watching kind of a this weird has guy. no no knowledge about Iron Maiden is going, what the hell are they yeah. doing? Um <laughs> yeah. anyway. Uh, Anyways. Dr. Kip Davis, you, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh where can people find you? I have a channel on YouTube. It's called Kip Davis. Uh so that's easy. Um I restrict my social media persona to YouTube, so you can't really find me anywhere else. Um I do have an academia page, and if if you're desperate to get in touch with me, that that might be the best place uh, to go to to chat with me directly. Um, so yes, that's awesome. me. Thanks so much Lovely. for this. This was yeah, super no. fun. Oh, no, that, that means a lot. Thank you, Kit, because you know. And I'm I honored. Just... I'm honored to have been here for your first super chat. Hey, and you know, massive thanks to all the super yeah. chatters who did their stuff and contributing. And if I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I mentioned all your names and Dean McKenzie, I think was in there with with one of everyone. So it's just amazing. Thank you so much for all your all of your assistance, uh, Kip. You, you've been a pleasure. Um, I, I look forward to hopefully talking to you again at some point in the future. There's yeah, I'd like that a, a lot that you've got to say. I'm sure on pretty much everything I think we can think about talking about because, uh, you know, it, it, you know, that you've got a wide ranging knowledge. It is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to big you up. Um, uh, but you know, thank you so much. Take care. And, uh, for everyone else out there, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for liking. Thank you. Please subscribe and do all that kind of YouTube stuff. I always ask you to do, but I don't really know what it means. And, <laughs> uh, and question everything, particularly yourselves. Take care. And thanks for, thanks, thanks for joining Bye, everyone. Me. Bye-bye.